one of the things I want to talk about is how we think about what we're doing in Gleesa. And one of the ways I think about it sometimes is we've talked about evolving better solutions, and we know that there's no evolution without variation. So part of what we're about is trying to produce some variation in how people think about or, or implement uh, efforts at climate adaptation so we can learn what works and what doesn't. I'll put in a slide uh, that quotes Gide. I didn't put that in today, but I should have because the quote basically said that what I'm, everything that's worth saying has already been said, um, but it's worth repeating because not everybody got it the first time through. And that's kind of the position that I'm in. Uh, most, much of what I'm said, going to say has already been mentioned, particularly the issue of co-production of knowledge, uh, which Adam mentioned, and integrating multiple forms of expertise, uh, including of course, scientific expertise, but also being respectful that there are other forms of expertise that have to be engaged. And the idea of changing the research program through new and evolving practices is really the central theme as well. So with regard to uncertainty, we don't know the future trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. Even if we did, the GCMs uh, would yield uncertain results. Even if the GCMs were certain, downscaling to the local and regional level would be uncertain. Even if we had certain local projections, the response of coupled human and natural systems under multiple stresses would be uncertain. And even if they weren't, we wouldn't know how people and organizations would respond to policies. So there's a lot of uncertainty in this business. We all know that. So I want to offer a general point. There is no solution to the global problems we face, and we don't know what to do about them. Thank you very much. <laughs> there are solutions, not a single solution. And we don't know what to do, but we can learn by doing. We need to have social learning to develop solutions that work. How does social learning occur? How can we make it more effective? That, I think, is what we're trying to do with police, is to answer those kinds of questions. Not only do good work in terms of facilitating climate adaptation, but learn as we go so that we can learn to do this better. Uncertainty doesn't paralyze us in any other domain of decision making. We make economic, health, and geopolitical decisions with just as much or perhaps even more uncertainty. And there's consensus that we need to use what is usually called adaptive risk management to deal with climate change. And I point out, and these have already been mentioned, the America's Climate Choices Study, which is the largest study ever done by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Actually, I think I could say full stop, but certainly on climate change. There were four reports um, advancing the science of climate change, adapting to the impacts of climate change, a report on informing decisions, and a report on limiting the magnitude, and then the overall America's Climate Choices report that synthesized those. And those are available on the web. They're a little bit out of date now, but still pretty good syntheses of the literature. And all of them call for either adaptive or, in some cases, iterative. That was a slight distinction in language, risk management as a way to deal with the fact that we need to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. And by the way, on the role of the social sciences, of the four substantive reports, the uh, vice chair of every one of those four reports was a social scientist. So that says something about the level of respect for social science and climate change, at least at the level of the National Academy's process. So what is adaptive risk management? Uh, the, these reports define it as an ongoing process of identifying risks and response options, advancing a portfolio of actions that emphasize risk reduction and that are robust across a range of possible futures and revising responses over time to take advantage of new knowledge, include, including new knowledge about what works and what doesn't work, not just new knowledge in the physical and ecological sciences, but if you will, new knowledge in the social sciences so we have a better sense of what works and what doesn't. We have to learn more about climate, climate change, its impacts, and effective responses. But equally important, we have to learn how to learn. We have to develop strategies to promote social learning for sustainability. That's what I believe we're up to, and that's the, the approach that Gleesa is taking. There is, of course, a traditional model of linking science to society uh, that's been working in the U.S. since the Morrill Land Grant Acts of 1862 and 1890, and then the expansion of that idea to the Sea Grant Act. And, of course, as, as you have heard and will hear, we work very closely with both land grant extension and sea grant extension, and I'm very supportive of those models. Um, experiment stations who do research and extension agents form a link between researchers and those who can use the science to make better decisions. This approach has some flaws, but it's been reasonably effective. In a sense, the land grant system is the first and probably the largest example of an effort to bridge between researchers and those
those who could make better decisions based on research. Now we need bridging institutions for climate change. Within our region, and this is true in most regions, we've got many sectors, many organizations working with those sectors, many kinds of decision makers in each sector, local government, state government, federal government, small businesses, large businesses, non-governmental organizations. Some are focused on climate change. Some are aware of climate change and are taking some steps to deal with it. Some are aware but are not yet taking any actions, and some are not aware, and some, indeed, some are actively denying that this is an issue or a problem. But the land-grant model won't translate directly into climate change, at least not without a huge change in the uh, size of the federal budget to do this kind of work. While the land-grant model, I think, is very effective, it's very expensive to expand across the many kinds of actors and many sectors that we have to do to deal with if we're going to uh, address the issue of climate change. There's also the problem, excuse the social science jargon, of homophily. There's a tendency to associate with, trust, and learn from people like you and to avoid those who are different. And we know this happens all the time in policy systems. And it's particularly problematic around the issue of climate change because climate change as it's evolving, affects so many different sectors and those sectors interact with one another. The actors in our region are at very different stages of engagement with climate change. So, so you're having to work with people who are just looking for very detailed and highly refined technical assistance because they already know what they're doing to people who aren't even sure this is a real problem. For very few of them is climate change their central responsibility or the worst problem that they're dealing with. And, of course, the knowledge is evolving very quickly, not only the knowledge of the climate system itself, but how public human and natural systems respond to it, and uh, knowledge about why policies work and don't work. So what we're trying to do is be a bridging organization for bridging organizations. This is a phrase I first heard from David. Our fundamental goal is to promote social learning about adaptation to climate change. Social learning can be accomplished by networks that facilitate the sharing of information, the generation of new understanding, and the easy incorporation of new members. So we spend a lot of time emphasizing, understanding the kinds of networks that exist in this region, following them, following them as they evolve, and indeed trying to intervene to uh, generate network structures uh, that are very effective at both uh, sharing information but also generating new information and ultimately incorporating new members into those networks as more and more folks realize that they need to deal with climate change. And bridges, we believe, play a key role in that. A bridge can be an individual, and there are some individuals that are, are very effective in that regard. They can be organizations. They can be processes, like assessment processes that bring together groups or even simply workshops. They can be websites, and we have an experiment going uh, led by Ricky Rood where we're, uh, Don showed you a slide of this, where we have a website that can be used as a collaboratory as well as just a guide to information. Reports can actually be bridges in some cases and meetings of this sort and others. So there are a lot of different ways of doing bridging, and we're trying to understand what works and what doesn't work, and then, of course, to facilitate the kinds of bridging that do work. So our strategy is to understand the structure and dynamics of regional climate adaptation networks. We're trying to identify leverage points. We fund innovation in bridging within the existing network, and we are trying to fund activities that extend the network of people who are thinking about sharing information and strategies about climate change. Then we study those innovations to see what works and what doesn't. And if everything we funded was completely successful, we'd actually be in trouble because we'd have no variation to learn from. So we're trying to be a little edgy. Um, in, in, not in the hopes that any of these things will fail. And I, I guess I put it differently the way Maria Carmen did this morning. It, it's not that they'll, some will fail, but they will do different things in different ways. And from that variation, we can learn about what produces what kinds of results and then try to extract lessons that can help us design projects for the future. We experiment with tools that can provide uh, help without trying to be a service organization to all or only a few. And this is, again, the difference between us, I think, and, and perhaps the tradition of extension and experiment station, where the resources simply don't exist to do that kind of intensive outreach. Uh, and certainly, and if you talk to anybody in experiment station work or extension work, they're resource short as well. Uh, but to try to ratchet up that model uh, as a way to do climate and 
implementation, I think, is not going to be successful because the resources simply aren't there. So we're trying to do something that perhaps is a slightly higher, uh, has slightly higher leverage. And so three examples are, as I mentioned, the Gleesa Climate Collaboratory site, so a website is a potential bridging tool. The climatologies that Don showed you that are on the web, providing local information for people to think about what has happened historically with climate and what are the trends, because we found that's often extremely convincing, uh, perhaps more so in some cases than the projections. And also that Don mentioned the NCA regional white papers and kindred products. We took the lead in producing the input into the National Climate Assessment for the region. So there's a whole series of papers out there that describe the best that we know, best that we understand about science uh, for climate change in different sectors for this, this region. And it can be a starting point for people's learning and discussions about the issue. And so with that, I'll stop as sort of a set of philosophy.